Uh, good morning. Uh, the, welcome to the last lecture. Today is um, just a kind of a recap lecture. Mostly I want to um, go through what we've learned so far, what we've learned through the course, um, revisit some subjects very briefly, answer any questions you might have, and uh, give you some like, exam strategies. And then uh, finally, so that's the first half, or the plan for the first half. So I'll start with a review. Uh, then we'll talk briefly about the exam. Try and answer any questions. And then I'd like to finish up after the break with a little um, sort of outlook, see where we are in machine learning, what we, uh, what the, the current state of, uh, state of things is, and what the impact and the, uh, the future of machine learning might hold. So let's call that outlook. And that'll be it for today. So the first thing in the review, I thought I'll choose. I'll try and choose one slide from every lecture, and put them all in the row and see what the see if we can discern a kind of through line. So in that way, we can sort of step uh, step through all the lectures. Here are all the lectures. This is a uh, oh louder, louder. It's better. Oh, all right. So um, slide one. This is from the first lecture. I um, uh, this is basically the overview of the course. So here are all the things we've done, all the things we've talked about. We are here now. Uh, so this is a good uh, good slide to print out and start for your uh, when you're studying for the exam. This is also from the first lecture. So this is uh, where we started in the first lecture with the basic recipe of machine learning, right? So this basic principle of if you have a problem and you think machine learning might solve it, then the standard way of approaching that is to abstract your problem or part of your problem to one of these standard tasks like classification or regression. Choose your instances and your features. Choose your model class and then search for a good model to fit those instances and features. And by now this should be not only very clear to you but you should have a mental image of, of how to do this, uh, what that might look like. And then in the, the second uh, lecture, we started to look at some real models and some real search methods. And this is probably the most important search method of all, the one that kept coming back again and again and again, namely gradient descent. So if we have a model with some parameters, and we compute the loss, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters, and we take a small step in the opposite direction. That's gradient descent. And we most of modern machine learning, as you've seen, is built on this. Although we saw a few other search methods, uh, uh, methods as well. Uh, second week we went into methodology, so how to do data science, how to do machine learning. And the most important thing we saw there was this idea of splitting off your uh, splitting off your data into a training and a test set, and then in order not to overuse the test set, to do the same thing again on your training data. So if you only remember one slide, this is probably the one you should remember. And we talked a lot about methodology and a lot of different things, but I think the main purpose, the main, uh, sorry, the main um, idea always to keep in mind when you get confused, because once you start, as you've noticed, once you start doing data science in the wild, there's always something that crops up that you didn't see in the lecture or didn't read in the book or wherever you learn machine learning from. So the idea is always to think about the real world use case. Like the, if you're learning, if you're training a machine learning model, you're training it to some purpose, with some end goal, you want to use it in some way, which is the real world use case. And it should be fair with respect to the real world use case. So all the numbers you're trying to uh, estimate, like accuracy, um, you want those to be estimates of how accurate your model is going to be in the real world. That's ultimately what you're after. So everything should uh, your decisions in your data science process should reflect that and should 
uh, come from that uh, from that place. So then we dug into probability, always a big, complicated subject. Too difficult to pick just one slide, but I went for this one: the um, logistic regression loss function, which is a combination of two things. We take this basic linear model here, w x plus b. We wrap it in a sigmoid function so that it outputs values between 0 and 1 so that we can interpret the outputs of the model as probabilities over our classes. That's step one. And then step two is to optimize those probabilities, um, basically just doing the following the maximum likelihood principle. But that ends up, uh, what you end up doing if you follow that is um, to look at these probabilities as predicted by the class probabilities as predicted by the uh, this sigmoid model. And you contrast that with the probabilities given by the data set, namely zero for every red dot and one for every blue dot. And you calculate the cross entropy between the two, which is why this is called cross entropy loss. So a sigmoid, sigmoid output on your linear function plus cross entropy loss equals logistic regression. And this was the very first um, sort of really useful loss function we saw for um, linear methods, for linear classification. And then we saw some more in the next lecture. So here's a, an overview slide. We started with accuracy and we noted that accuracy, even though accuracy is usually what we're trying to optimize, uh, it's not actually a very good loss function because it's not smooth. It has these, th it's like a step function. So you don't get a curve in your loss landscape that tells you where to go. So the first at uh, attempt was least squares. We just assign all the red dots the value minus one and we assign all the blue dots the value plus one. And then we pretend it's a re regression problem. And we fit a regression line and wherever the regression line hits the plane of the origin, we call that the decision boundary, which isn't great, but it's a place to start. Cross entropy, which we just saw. And then we talked about the soft margin SVM, which is this um, very basic principle that what we, wa what we want to do is to maximize the margin between the positive examples and the negative examples, which is this bit here. And it's a soft margin SVM because we allow some points, like these guys, to be on the wrong side of the margin. Uh, but then they pay this value as a penalty, which we add to the loss function. That's how they pay the penalty. So three, uh, well, four loss functions, two of which are uh, actually useful. And then another one from the same lecture I've cheated for two lectures, I've included two slides. Uh, because in this lecture, we also, for the first time, discussed the algorithm of backpropagation, which is uh, a way to compute the gradient for a very complicated model. So we've seen we like doing gradient descent. Gradient descent is a very good method, so we have to compute the gradient. But once our model gets very complicated, we can't work it out in pen and paper anymore. So what we can do in backpropagation is we break up our um, our model, our complicated model, into a composition of modules. So these modules here spell out what this neural network does. And then we apply the chain rule over and over and over again. So we get a chain of applications of the chain rule, which turns into a product of local derivatives. So all the factors in this product are the derivative of one of the modules with respect to its argument. And what we do is we work this out symbolically. We work out the local derivative symbolically. And we work out the global derivative numerically. So we just uh, work out the local derivative on pen and paper like this. Looks like this. We do a forward pass. So we put some number here. We compute it forward. We get a result. And then we fill in the intermediate values into these local gradients to compute the output. That's back propagation. Uh, and this is all for uh, scalars, scalar functions. 
to very complicated scalar functions, but still we look at everything just as scalars. Uh, the lecture after, we saw how to build this up into a really robust and, and uh, usable framework by moving from just scalars to vectors and matrices and tensors. And then we needed to uh, re revisit the backpropagation algorithm a little bit, adding the multivariate chain rule and adding the logic for dealing with tensors in, um, in backpropagation, which gave us something like this, a way to do backpropagation and compute derivatives over tensor functions. And that gave us the basic anatomy of a deep learning system, where we can really uh, compute the gradient over any smooth differentiable function over tensors. And tensors can hold lots and lots of types of data, like images and language and stuff like that. So that's very powerful. Uh, after that, we came back to um, more animations. We came back to um, probability, where we saw our first hidden variable model. Because before this, all the probability models were sort of just a single parameter and they produce some probability distribution. But here we have we have a probability model that models a sample from, um, or that models a an unseen variable, a variable that we, a uh, random variable that we don't get to see, z, from which we, uh, the observables are produced, from which the data that we see is produced. In this case, we talked about a uh, mixture of Gaussian, mo uh, Gaussian mixture model. So the hidden variable, we have three components, which are different Gaussians. The hidden variable is which of these components we pick. And then from that component, we pick an output. And we talked about ways of, um, given the observables, figuring out a distribution on the uh, hidden variables, which was called the expectation maximization algorithm. And the next lecture, we uh, expanded on this idea by um, talking about generator neural networks, which are hidden variable models that contain neural networks, specifically this kind where you sample a continuous vector from a multivariate normal distribution, you feed it to a neural network, and you observe the outputs, either directly or you interpret the outputs as the parameters of another probability distribution, which is just the same type of thing, uh, a hidden variable model. But now the parameters of the hidden variable model are the parameters of your neural network. So we looked at two ways of fitting those parameters to the data, generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders. Um, so it was probably the peak of the lecture in terms of difficulty. At least that was sort of the, the design. Um, and after that, we moved to uh, slightly more simple models called uh, tree models, decision trees, regression trees. Uh, we'd seen them throughout the lecture a number of times already, but the fir this was the first time we discussed the learning algorithm, uh, sometimes called ID3 or C4.5. And it's a very simple learning algorithm where you grow the tree progressively from the root out, and you grow it greedily. So you start with a single root node, and you add uh, nodes, which split the data set on one of the features, and you decide to which feature to split on next by looking at which feature gives you the highest information gain, which is a function involving entropy that we saw in the lectures. So that's three models. Uh, after that, we started deviating slightly from the standard from the basic recipe. So we started moving away from this idea of having instances and features per instance. And we looked at sequential data, looked at a lot of different models, uh, recurrent neural networks. Um, what else did we look at? Markov models, uh, word effect. But mainly, probably this slide is the most important thing. If you have data that is in some way sequential, for instance, if it contains timestamps, then usually what you want to do, the real-world use case that you're after, is predicting the future given the history. 
So predicting all the data you have up till now, you want to predict the future values of the data. That's usually the logical thing to, to want to do. In that case, what you should be careful about is that your training data should always be before, all your training data should always be before all your test data and time. So you should order your data along time, make a train test split like this. And then if you want to do cross-validation, you have to do walk forward cross-validation. So you have to uh, make multiple splits where you ensure that all your training data is always before all your validation data and then you average. Um, another deviation from the basic recipe was uh, the idea of a matrix model, specifically the idea of a, a recommender system, also called collaborative filtering, where um, the standard use case is, is of, of users and movies. And the defining property here is that we have no information about who our users are or what they look like or any features internal to our users and nothing about our movies. The only thing we know is the connections between the two, in this case, the rating. So the only thing we know is which user rated which movie saying that they liked it. And in this sort of basic setting, we can still infer information about the movies and about the users. And obviously, usually we do also know something about the users, so then we have to inject that somehow as side information, but starting with this basic principle, with this basic matrix of connections between our two objects, we can actually learn a lot about the object because this row here, which users the movie liked, is actually a very good feature vector for the user. It tells you a lot about the user. And this column here, by which users a particular movie is liked, is actually a very good feature vector for a movie. So that's very, uh, this is a very informative matrix, but you have these sort of mixed feature vectors. So you need to uh, deviate a little bit from the basic recipe and model your problem like this. That's matrix models. Which brings us to last Monday, when we talked about reinforcement learning. Uh, again, a new setting, new uh, way of doing things. Uh, instead of just keeping a fixed data set and interacting with the data, or uh, sorry, keeping a fixed data set, looking at the data set once or looping over it multiple times, but up to a certain point and then delivering one model. So ultimately learning and mapping from data to model, which is offline learning. Instead of doing that in reinforcement learning, we actually bring the environment into the abstract task. So we have an abstract task of an agent interacting with its environment. And probably the most uh, important principle in reinforcement learning is the trade-off between exploration and exploitation. Uh, or not just reinforcement learning, but any kind of online learning. Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, interesting question. The question is, does a convolutional neural network with dropout uh, count as an exploration versus exploitation uh, dilemma? I would say no. I would say that's still just an online, uh, sorry, that's still, well, obviously you can use it in reinforcement learning and then you have uh, uh, an exploration versus exploitation thing. But if you're just doing image classification using a convolutional neural network, um, even though you're doing dropout and you're optimizing the architecture of the network, that's basically just complicated hyperparameter search, complicated hyperparameter optimization. So there you're just um, you're just optimizing. You're just going for this goal. Whereas in exploration versus exploitation, um, the key to this trade-off is that you're actually uh, you're exploring search space, just like when you're doing architecture search. Um, but um, you have this sort of short-term uh, short term reward and long-term reward. So your short-term reward for exploring this space is low. It costs you to explore this space in the short term. But in the long term, it pays back because you learn more about your world. And because of that, um, you have this, um, uh, this trade-off. I suppose if you use reinforcement learning to do architecture search to optimize a classification problem, then you might run into this uh, uh, problem. But usually it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't come up in offline settings. 
Um, which brings us to today. So that's all we, we talked about. Um, and the problem with, with uh, talking about complicated subjects and big, uh, big bags of, of concepts is always that ideas are kind of a graph in our heads. But when we have to explain them, they're always a sequence, right? Uh, in my head, I have a knowledge graph of all these related concepts and different relations between the two. But when I have to explain them to you, I always have to give a lecture or I have to write some uh, homework or I have to write some lecture notes. And these are always sequential. So I always have to pick one line through this graph, one walk through the graph out of many. So let's try and reconstruct in some ways the sort of higher level different relations between the concepts that we've seen by drawing some mind maps. Um, so the I think the two main concepts, the two main types of things that we've talked about in the lecture are search and model. Maybe model should be at the top. So we talked about different types of models. Uh, like neural networks, which is a quite a generic model. So linear regression, linear classification, logistic regression, these are all instances of specific instances of neural networks. Uh, and the more complicated things are like uh, generated neural networks, which can be trained by, by GANs or by VAEs. A VAE is a bit like a gaussian mixture model because it's a variable model. gaussian mixture model is trained by EM, which is sort of a, a little, a slightly odd duck in the space of uh, search methods because most of them are forms of gradient descent or random search. Uh, I suppose alternating optimization I could have put here as well, which we, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, so you're looking at this line here. Uh, can you repeat? Sorry? Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so this, uh, thank you for asking the, that question because that's a, a particular point of confusion. So the line only goes to this one, logistic regression. And logistic regression is a classification method. So that's um, uh, clear to you, but maybe just for, for everybody. Uh, it's very confusing that we call it logistic regression. We do because it's sort of fitting a line through points, but it is a classification method. Uh, so, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, th the question is, is, is um, l uh, yeah, uh, is which loss functions apply to which methods? Uh, uh, for a regression method, can we use mean squared error? Um, Yes, uh, mean squared error, I should have put mean squared error up here as well, but there's a, um, that's sort of route one for regression problems. Um, yeah, and I think probably the most generic uh, thing we talked about is gradient descent, and then it's uh, specific variants like stochastic gradient descent, where instead of optimizing the gradient over the, the uh, gradient of the loss over the whole data, you optimize the gradient of the loss over one data item, and then you loop over all data items, um, which adds a little randomness to your um, stochastic gradient and makes it much faster. And then a sort of uh, compromise between the two is mini-batch gradient, where you compute the loss over something like a handful of data items, um, usually 32, 64, something like that. So you get the parallelism of being able to compute the loss over a, a batch as it's called, of items, of, of instances, so things get faster. But you don't look at your whole data in one go because then things get slower again, and then you lose this randomness. Uh, so that's mini batch gradient, and that's really what we use uh, most of the time, or all of the time, really. Um, so another way to look at it is these settings, these uh, uh, types of data and ways of dealing with data. So we've seen the, b the basic settings for uh, most of the uh, course where we split things into features, instances, and target values. But we've also dealt, dealt with sequences where we've 
separated the uh, setting of dealing with separate sequences, where every instance of, where every instance is one sequence, like in an e uh, email data set where you model an email as an, as a language sequence, but every instance, every email is another sequence, or cases where you're data set is one big sequence, like when you're predicting time series, like you're forecasting temperature, then you have one big sequence of temperature values, and your prediction task is to predict tomorrow's temperature based on the history of temperature so far. Um, well, recommender systems, we've uh, discussed already. So there's this col collaborative filtering uh, idea. And then online uh, learnings of uh, online learning, so um, learning while you're acting in the world, learning while you're predicting and while you're making actions, while you're exploring, um, of which we've seen one example, which is reinforcement learning. And then deep learning is sort of halfway between a setting and a model, in that it's a kind of approach to all of these settings. But there's this fundamental idea of building a pipeline end-to-end, -end, of not doing any feature extraction manually, because you don't want to lose any information, of making sure that you build a deep model that can um, consume the raw data. And every manipulation you do on the raw data is, is learnable, so that you never potentially, you, you never, um, well, you, you lose information, obviously, because you translate a complex object to something like a classification. Um, but that's all those, uh, what information you lose, that's always a choice made by the learning algorithm and not by you before you start learning. Which leads to complex deep models and we apply, uh, we always use back propagation to train that. So to make things simpler, we only stick to one learning algorithm, but we make things more complicated by building these pipelines. Uh, this is kind of more of a word cloud than a mind map, but uh, these are all the things we talked about in probability. I won't go through all of them. Uh, but maybe just while you're uh, studying for the exam, this is a good slide to pull up and see if you can explain all these things to yourself. Some, tri uh, some tricks of the trade, by which I mean the things you, the sort of uh, the items in your tool belt or in your toolbox when you're doing data science, when you're trying to train a model and it doesn't work or you want something specific from it, the things you might reach for, the tricks you might try. Obviously there's the test set validation set and training set split, that's your basic first step in setting up your data science project. But then if it doesn't work, applying a regularizer is always a good idea. Normalization is always important to get it to work in the first place. Imputation can be important to get rid of outliers. Uh, imputation and outlier can removal can be important to pre-process your data. And uh, well, I won't go into these things, but uh, you things you um, need to think about or things you need to try. And finally, before we move to the exam itself, these are all the abstract tasks we talked about. And we saw classification, regression, density estimation generative modeling, dimensionality reduction, recommendation, and reinforcement learning. Uh, probably not all of them, but um, pretty close to all, all of them. And these are more or less all of the models uh, that, uh, that we talked about in the lecture, I think. So again, uh, an overview to use while you're trying to build a picture of, of everything we talked about in your head. So that's a review. Let's look at the, the exam briefly. Give you some tips for how to study for it. So first of all, there'll be 40 questions. Uh, each one of them, well, you've, most of you will have seen the practice exam, so you sort of know what to expect, but um, there's 40 questions, four answers each. Um, and there are three categories of, que uh, of uh, question. The recall questions are basically things that are that you can remember from the slides. If you've read all the slides and you remember all of them, a recall question is something that you can remember from one place in the slide and easily answer it without having to think too deep or to combine many concepts. Um, a combination question is a little bit more difficult. 
combination question are things like uh, questions where you have to remember two things from different places in the lecture and combine them to show that you actually understood what they said. Um, or maybe uh, questions that refer to just one place in the lecture, but they ask uh, a negative question, so uh, which of the following is false? Which is always a little bit more difficult. Uh, so we call those combination questions. And then there's application questions. So it's the sort of thing we've uh, been practicing in the homework and you've seen also in the practice exam, the things where you have to compute something, work through an algorithm, um, do something, uh, yeah, actively work through a problem. So those are the three types of questions you can expect. This is uh, the time that remains for you to study for the exam. Assuming that you spend eight hours a day learning, this is us now, so I'm wasting your time by talking. But after I'm done, this is the time that you have. This is Monday, assuming you have some, uh, spend some time on Monday as well. Um, so this is just to motivate you, this is all you have left. In this time, you have to work out, you have to work your way through everything we've just talked about. Um, so the first tip, in order to help you do that. I'm pretty sure all of you know this already, but if you're listening to the lectures, you can speed them up. Um, so that already, if you put the speed on two, that already sort of doubles the amount of time you have. Um, then you have to deal with things like procrastination. If you're anything like me, um, the moment the time comes to do something, that especially something that I want to do well, I start doing other things, and I start procrastinating, and I start doing uh, not doing those things that I have to do. Um, so just some tips. I mean, I was worried that this might be slightly patronizing. I mean, you're third year students, you know how to study, you know how to deal with procrastination, presumably, but I also get the feedback that some people find these things helpful, so I'll go into it briefly. So the way to beat procrastination well, the first thing to realize about procrastination is that it's not a failure in discipline or a failure in willpower. It's not a personality trait. It's not a failure in your personality. It's actually an effect of, um, it's, it's usually an effect of perfectionism caused by perfectionism. It's usually the things that you want to do so well that you build them up in your head that you then don't want to do them anymore because they become too big, they become too scary. So don't think of it as a, a failing in your personality, think of it as just this little psychological short circuit that you have to deal with. Um, and the main thing to do if you find yourself procrastinating is to find the smallest viable commitment, I've called it here. Basically, so if you have to, um, I mean, for me it's usually presentations. If I have to make a presentation, I start procrastinating very much. So if I sort of can't face this anymore, can't face going to the computer and then starting up Keynote, uh, and, and working out this whole lecture, or a whole lecture or presentation or whatever I have to make. I try and find the smallest thing I can do that I can sort of face, which can just be work for five minutes. Just something that is so small that it seems idiotic, or just while you're watching Netflix, open up Keynote, or in your case, if you're procrastinating for the exam, while you're watching Netflix, open up one of the uh, lecture PDFs and just look at it. Just do that and tell yourself, if I do that, then I'm allowed to take a break. And the main thing is just to, to take this thing that, that has become too big in your head and to shrink it and to work it into little bite-sized pieces again. Because once you start doing those things, you'll see that it will slowly, the, the procrastination drive will start to uh, diminish. It's important to get an overview of what you have to do to sort of give yourself uh, something like a progress bar where you say, well, this is where I start, and if I reach this point, then I'm done. Because if you have in some way this progress bar, that can be incredibly important to motivate you. So if you, for instance, make a little diagram with all the lectures, and you tick off all the ones that you've understood, then you give yourself a kind of progress bar. Uh, and it stops being this sort of endless thing that's never finished. 
yeah, and don't be perfectionists. So don't, uh, what, what's the saying? Uh, perfect is the enemy of good. If you try and get things perfect, you will end up procrastinating and you'll end up hating yourself. Whereas if you try and do just a good job very quickly and then see what time remains and then see what you can do in the time that remains then, um, it's uh, where you get the sort of process where you, instead of going for the perfect solution in one go, you go for a good solution and then you iterate to make it better, um, things get a lot more motivating and you get a lot more intermediate results, which always helps you know a bit. I'm a big fan of the uh, Pomodoro technique. Uh, who's heard of this before? No, show of hands. That's about 50-50, I think. So it's a very straightforward idea. You, um, when you have to do something, could be anything, uh, learning, programming, you get a kitchen timer. You usually do this on your computer, but uh, that's why it's called the Pomodoro technique. These kitchen timers are of often shaped like tomatoes for some reason. So you get a kitchen timer. You set it for 25 minutes, and for those 25 minutes, you work uh, fully focused, as hard as you can, without distraction. So you turn off your phone, turn off anything you can turn off, and you really commit to just for 25 minutes working with extreme focus. Then the timer goes, and then you take a break. A break of five minutes, and then you start again. That's called one Pomodoro. And if you've done four Pomodoro, yeah, sorry, the terminology is <laughs> a little bit stupid, but that's what it's called. If you've done four of them, you take a half hour break. And the idea here is what you find once you start doing this, first of all, that you get a lot done in 25 minutes. And secondly, that it is usually as difficult to start as it is to stop. So when you start, you have procrastination, lots of things you want to do more. At that 25 minute mark, you're getting into it and it starts going. And both are uh, at both times, it's equally important to be disciplined. Because that, fi that five minute break to give your brain some rest is just as important to keep you going throughout the rest of the day as it is to get started uh, in the first place. So in order to, um, I have time for this. Uh, yeah, right, so let's do this briefly. This is always a good exercise because of the reasons I've just talked about. So let's start. Uh, yeah. So instead of saying the exam starts in uh, four days, let's say the exam starts in ten minutes. What would you do? So uh, imagine even worse. I, I promise it's not true. We won't have the exam in ten minutes. But how do you spend ten minutes getting from the point where you are now to a point where you get a better grade than you would have if you had the exam now? Because it's quick, but it's still some learning time. What I would do personally in your place is I would probably go for the practice exam if you have only this amount of time. Practice exams are the fastest way to, uh, to get there. And pick a random question and look the answer to that question up in the slides. And do that again and maybe oh, you could probably get three questions. And if that subject is, uh, because the practice exam is a good indication of what kind of things the exam will be about. If you have 30 minutes, you can be a little bit more uh, uh, precise or uh, more uh, thorough. And if you have a whole day, so if it's tomorrow, then you can actually uh, have a look at, at getting an overview of, of everything in the slides and see what you can do. The main thing about this exercise, this mental exercise, is that every hour, every block I drew in that diagram earlier is six of these. So if you can do something in 10 minutes that helps you get more points on the exam, then in one hour you can do six of those, and so on and so on. So it's sort of this, uh, this um, procrastination thing again. Look at this smallest viable commitment and then ju just do loads of those. Uh, more practically for this exam, I would say focus on the lectures, not the reading. Um, the reading is there to sort of support the lecture, so if you don't understand something in the lecture, look at the reading. Or if you find it interesting, definitely read the reading, but um, purely for the exam, focus on what's uh, said in the lecture. Focus on the first 10 lectures, which is where most of the content comes from. There will be questions about the other uh, three lectures, 
not about this one, but about the other three lectures. Um, and I would recommend making, instead of starting at lecture one and reading everything thoroughly and stopping if you don't understand something and so on, I would say make a quick pass so that you can figure out what you do understand and what you don't understand. So figure out what the gaps in your knowledge are. Um, and then once you have this overview, then start digging into those gaps and start saying, well, can I, ha can I understand this particular gap? Can I understand that particular part? Um, because otherwise you're in, uh, well, firstly, you get a very slow progress bar, which is demotivating. And secondly, you're in danger of uh, misusing your time. If you stay too long on one particular problem instead of just trying to understand uh, trying quickly and then moving on, you're in danger of over-focusing on one problem. One trick I liked myself when I was a student is to make a keyword list. So as you're learning, just make a big list of lots of keywords of things that are described. Because that gives you an overview that you can point to. You can point to a random keyword uh, afterwards, once you have this keyword list, just point to a random keyword, think, do I really understand this? If you don't, you can look it up and you can point to another random keyword, and so on and so on. So once you have this keyword list, you can do these quick 10-minute things, tricks to improve your understanding. Uh, come up with your own exam questions, not necessarily to practice, but to figure out which parts are interesting to learn for the exam. So when I look at the slides, when I make the exam questions, I look at the slides, pick a random slide sheet, then I make a question of that. Sometimes I think, well, that's an important subject, I'm glad we discussed it, but I can't really work it into an exam question. It just that's just the way it is. Some things are fruitful for exam questions. Some things make good good exam questions. Others don't. And if you are running out of time and you have to prioritize, prioritize on the things that make good exam questions. So if you think in your head, could I write an exam question about this? Um, if so, prioritize it. If not, you can maybe deprioritize it with the slight risk that I can come up with an exam question that you can't come up with. But in general, it's probably a good way to prioritize. Um, we have a lot of slides like this. These sort of the nightmare slides uh, where I go through a long mathematical derivation. Um, these are very important and I hope you all try and understand them. But in the exam, there are not that many of them. There are not that many of there. There are not that many places where you have to really understand a derivation like this or do something like this yourself. And the places, uh, the the uh, the ones there are, you will have seen in the homework and you will have seen in the um, uh, practice exams. So you should be prepared for those. So if you hit one of these points in the slide, I would say focus on the ins and outs. So focus on the incoming part and the outcoming part and forget what's in the middle, because that's the message of the slide. The point of the slide is we have, in this case, we have a gradient here, which has an expectation on the inside, so we can't compute it. So we work it around, blah, 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 so that the expectation is on the outside, and then we can estimate it. That's the point of the slide, and that's really the only thing that you have to focus on. Um, Finally, the recommended reading I would like to uh, point to. It's, it sounds slightly counterintuitive if you're running out of time to add to the reading. But usually reading something in different perspective and quickly reading different takes on a particular subject can really help you understand something. Uh, there's some recommended reading in the uh, on the uh, canvas, which is sort of, uh, yeah, not required reading, uh, not stuff we, uh, you have to read, but if you want to read different takes on a particular subject, it can be really helpful. Um, and often if you have three sources for something, it is much quicker to read those three sources quickly than to really get all the information from one source. Um, particular one I want to point out is the Google Machine Learning course, Google Machine Learning Crash Course, called Introduction to Machine Learning, which is very good, talks about a lot of the same things we talked about. Uh, some nice videos, so if if you don't like the way I explained it, see if they explain it better. Uh, and they have a very nice glossary page, 
which is a little bit like our terminology page on the canvas, but a lot more uh, extended. So if there's a subject you don't understand, a topic you don't understand, have a look at this page, because you might find it there. Um, if you struggle with probability, which is a particular uh, a problem point for a lot, a lot of people, have a look at the page called Seeing Theory. It's also linked on the related um, uh, recommended reading. Uh, because it has a really uh, helpful and nice and intuitive way of uh, explaining probability. I highly recommend that. Last slide before the break. Um, I will be, uh, I'll do my best over the next few days, over the weekend and on Monday to uh, have a look at the discussion board and try and answer in depth anything uh, people ask there. So if you have a question, please ask it there. Um, and um, have a look also at the things that are already answered. So there's uh, most likely somebody's already asked your question and there's a nice explanation there already. So keep an eye on the discussion board. I will try to do the same. Um, well, take some questions after the break. Do a break first. So let's uh, take a 15 minute break and then we'll continue with the outlook part of the plan. All right, let's get started again. Um, I think I forgot to leave time for questions, so let's do that now. I answered a lot of questions in the break already, but maybe it's, there might be some more questions. Does anybody else have any specific things they'd like, like me to explain now or, or quick questions about the exam? Okay, great. Well, um, if anything comes to mind, feel free to uh, either raise your hand now or if it comes to mind afterwards, feel free to ask on the discussion board or send me an email. And then we can sort of um, see if we can wrap things up nicely now by talking a little bit about where we are now in machine learning and where we're going. So an obvious place to start is the open problems. What, um, what's, what are the sort of interesting research problems? What can't we do yet in machine learning now? And I like to think about that as a sort of big three. I think if you ask most people, they will land on uh, at least uh, one or two of these problems. Uh, causality, compositionality, and generalization. These are the main things. So we have very impressive machine learning models now that can do very impressive things, like generate human faces and win Go and stuff like that, play StarCraft. But these are the things that in general all these modern machine learning problems uh, methods struggle with. So let's start with causality. Uh, I think you've all heard probably somewhere that correlation does not imply causation. So if I find from my data that I have two variables, two features A and B, and I find that I can predict A from B, and therefore also B from A, then I cannot infer from my data whether A caused B, rather B caused A, so which precedes which in time, or whether A and B are caused by the same thing. It has to be one of those three, I think. But I cannot identify which. In order to do that, I need to, uh, yeah, I can find the correlation, I can find that I can predict one from the other, but not the, uh, not the causation. And to identify causation, I need intervention. intervention. So I need this kind of reinforcement learning setting where I can take an action in, in the world and I can do an experiment in the world and observe the results of that experiment and then I can work out which way the arrow, arrow of causation uh, goes. Um, so offline learning cannot find causative relations. That's important to, in, to start with, uh, to know. Um, there are some things that you can do if you don't have uh, the ability to do experiments, which happens often because lots of things we can't experiment on uh, for ethical reasons or for practical reasons. Uh, and that is to, to use background knowledge. So if you know something about the world, if you know something about your domain, you can inject that into your model, usually drawing little by drawing little graphs like this. So here we have uh, three events, the alarm, fails, there is traffic, and I'm late for work. Uh, 
Um, so being late for work has two possible causes in this model of the world. And this is sort of, we don't model all the world, usually we model the primary causes of things. The main cause, we want to capture most of the important things and we, see, we know that uh, this kind of model doesn't capture everything. Um, and using this kind of model, if I know this to be true, I can make inferences about causality. Because basically what this says is that uh, there is no known causal link between the alarm and the traffic. Uh, there is no way in which there being traffic causes my alarm to fail or my alarm failing causes there to be traffic. Uh, so there's no link here and we can use that in our inference. For instance, if we notice a core, if we do notice a correlation now, so we look at all our days that we've been late and we do notice a correlation between the alarm failing to go off and there being traffic, then we know that they have to have a common cause. Because there has to be some something that causes that correlation if it's strong enough, if it's statistically significant, then there has to be something that causes that correlation. There is no cause between the two one way or the other. So there has to be a common cause. For instance, if there's a disaster and there's a power cut, then there will be both traffic and my alarm will go off. So in this way, background knowledge can help you reason about correlations and uh, what causations they lead to. But you have to mix this into your machine learning model. You have to somehow take this kind of reasoning fit it into your machine learning model in a way that works together with uh, sub-symbolic methods like uh, deep learning, where you just learn from raw pixels and you learn from raw data. Um, gradient descent, it has to work together with backpropagation. So that's, we have some understanding of causality, but it's very difficult to marry it at the moment with um, the way most successful, the most successful machine learning methods work. But ultimately, this is the kind of understanding we as humans have of causality. So we want our agents, our intelligent agents, to have this kind of understanding of causality. Compositionality refers to the property of um, sort of human ideas, mostly language, um, where they, um, they are built up from small units that are composed together in uh, using rules of composition. So a sentence is made up of words composed together and the meaning of that sentence follows from the words I've chosen in the sentence and the way I've composed them. So you have this sort of small space of uh, basic units and you can endlessly compose them to make an endless space of things that uh, mean something and that sort of never fails. No matter how far you go and how, more how much you compose them, the thing always keeps working. And we see a little bit of compos compositionality uh, in learned representation so far. So this is the word to vec example I showed you, where you can take the embedding vector for king and you subtract uh, or you add this feminine vector and you get queen. So that's very nice, but this fails pretty quickly. Firstly, it, it works for almost no, uh, well, uh, it works for, it doesn't work for all uh, concepts. And if it does work, once you start composing it, once you uh, start doing this multiple times, so you go from queen, or you go from the result of this to, you add some other vector and you add some other vector to that, and so on and so on, you start losing this accuracy pretty quickly. So you don't have this nice compositionality that we have where you can just keep composing stuff and it keeps working. Um, and we don't know how to do that yet. We don't know how to achieve this kind of comp compositionality. And then there's the problem of generalization, uh, which uh, is, is best observed. We see it, it happens everywhere in machine learning, but it's best observed in recurrent neural networks. So if you train a recurrent neural network to some numbers, so you just give it a sequence of uh, one thing and a sequence of the other thing, and you train it to sum the two, um, Actually, probably you don't even need a recurrent neural network for this. Um, that works very well. You can train networks to some numbers, uh, even if the numbers are pixels, like digits, like the endless digits. Um, but it works very specifically on the domain that you train it on. 
So if we train it on the numbers from 1 to 10, and then test on the numbers from 1 to uh, 15, it will fail spectacularly on anything over 10, on anything that it hasn't seen during the training data, even though it's composed of the digits that it already knows. Uh, and you see this in lots and lots of situations where as uh, where uh, a machine learning model learns something very well, it learns its training data very well, but as soon as you take one step outside of the training data, uh, the training domain, it fails completely. For instance, if you um, do image classification, you get a classifier that's very good at recognizing school buses. But then if you show it a school bus that is slightly rotated in an unnatural way, like you show it the underside of a school bus, which humans uh, can recognize very well. If it's not fully rotated, we can still recognize, well, that's a school bus just from an odd angle. Classifier completely fails. So that's a problem of generalization. If your test domain is slightly different from your training domain, basically everything collapses. Whereas humans are able to generalize because we know that a school bus is a 3D object, so we can imagine what it would look like if it rotated. We have this sort of higher level understanding that machine learning models don't seem to have at the moment. And the solution to these things lies probably in thinking about the inductive bias. This is a word we haven't heard before, but it's an important word in machine learning. And it basically refers to the um, implicit or explicit constraints that you place on your model the way uh, you bias your model towards certain solutions in your model space and away from other solutions in the model space. Let's look at some examples to make that clear. So here's the multi-layer perceptron, a fully connected multi-layer neural network, which is basically a kind of model with almost no inductive biases. Uh, it's just saying we know the input is a bunch of numbers, we don't know how one number relates to the other, so we just build up some higher representation and we just connect everything to everything because we don't know anything else. And it's kind of, if you imagine that the input here is an image, what you're basically saying is that you're, and you're doing image classification, what you're basically saying is that if you took your data set and you permuted all the pixels, so you shuffled all the pixels around but in a fixed way, and you get very noisy images. The same data, uh, that data set would be just as difficult or as easy for this kind of neural network. Because it assumes no kind of ordering in the pixels or no grid structure in the pixels. It's just a bag of numbers. Um, so that sort of gives you a visual idea of, of how general these methods are and how, uh, the, yeah, how little they assume about their data and as a result how poorly they fare compared to methods that have stronger inductive biases, like the convolutional neural network, which, uh, I mean, this is not an exact, exact art describing inductive biases, but um, I would describe them as follows. So you assume with a recurrent neural network, firstly, that the data has a grid structure. So it's not just a bag of numbers. It's a bunch of numbers arranged into a grid to form a picture. Uh, we assume also that inputs that are far apart on the grid are not relevant for low-level features. So at the start of our neural network, we don't want to learn relation between a pixel that's over here and a pixel that's over here. We only care about the local neighborhood of the data. So locality is important for low-level features. And the low-level feature extractors are translation invariant. So the kernel that we apply to one part of the image is the same. We don't know its weights, but whatever its weights are, they can be the same as the weights we apply to another part of the image because the feature ex extractor is translation invariant. So if you move it around the image, but you keep the weights the same, that shouldn't hurt. And those are basically the inductive biases of convolutional neural networks that I could think of. If you look at LSTMs, they also have fairly clear inductive biases. So firstly, we assume that the data is a sequence. That's the shape we assume on our data. We assume that each token of that sequence, each, like each word in the sentence, um, 
can be modeled as a result of the tokens preceding it. So we have it, it not only is it laid out like a sequence, we also assume that there is this strong sequential relationship, this sort of strong arrow of time to the data where every part of the sentence follows naturally from the parts preceding it. And so up to here it says the recurring neural network and then the specific LSTM uh, idea that, ma that makes the LSTM is that many tokens can be forgotten. forgotten. So many tokens in the sequence are irrelevant and we can infer whether or not a sequence is or whether or not a token is irrelevant by looking at the token itself together with the uh, immediate context. So here in the LSTM, in this part of the LSTM, we look at what the token is and what the LSTM has been doing so far and we decide whether or not to ignore that token, to forget, uh, to ignore the token or to forget what we've currently been remembering and add the token to memory. So that's sort of the inductive bias of an LSTM. And the way that it's thinking about inductive biases will help us hopefully solve these causality, compositionality, and generalization problems, is that we can inject, well, with causality, we can hopefully inject this background knowledge, these things that we know about the world, we can inject them into the model through this inductive bias. So what you see here is that the inductive bias is put in through the model in the way we sh lay out this neural network, in the way we shape this neural network, we can build an inductive bias into the model. And hopefully there is some way to also build background knowledge into the model or to build a model that can read background knowledge. Um, in terms of composi compositionality, there might be a way, an inductive bias, to a way to shape a model that can, that has a natural preference to representations that are compositional. That would be nice. Or we could actually, if we know the rules of composition, like we do with language or with programming languages and stuff like that, we can actually model them explicitly and build them explicitly into the network. And with generalization, it's sort of more uh, general that the more we constrain our model, so the stronger our inductive bias, the more likely we are to generalize properly. So if we build the explicitly build the rules of summation into our network, then we know, and this has been done, then we know that the network will learn to some digits up to 1,000, even if it's only seen digits up to 100 in the training data. But there's a drawback, so here's a, there, in this case, there's a trade-off to be made, because the more we constrain the model, the less robust it is against the things we didn't model. So at the extreme end, you get sort of logical learning methods uh, and uh, logical AI methods that work very, very well on very little data, but the slightest bit of noise makes the logic inconsistent and everything breaks down. So there's this spectrum between the MLP and logic learning, and somewhere on the spectrum you have to be to make this trade-off towards generalization. And ultimately what we would like to end up with in machine learning is a framework, a language, where instead of coming up with a successful model and then thinking, I wonder how we can describe its inductive bias, is some way that we can start with the inductive bias and then let the model follow from that. Uh, but we're not there yet. So let's look at the, what the future will bring now that we have machine learning that works well. We can do interesting things. What's that going to mean for us and our future? Let's start close to home. So what's it going to mean for computer science uh, and, and computer systems in general? Well, practically, what you will see probably is more end-to-end -end learning. So we talked about this idea before that if you want to infer um, knowledge from newspaper print, you have to do lots of steps, OCR, name density recognition, relation extraction, stuff like that. Um, and if all of those modules are differentiable, then you have an end-to-end -end learning assistant and then you have a chance of this stuff actually working. Which means that machine learning is likely going to move from small little units that are built into a larger computer system. It's going to spread like a virus throughout the whole computer system because the more things you can make machine learnable, the more you can train the system end to end and the better the whole thing is going to work. 
which has led to uh, something called differential programming, also called software 2.0. Um, the idea that we might start moving towards <coughs> programming primitives, pro programming language primitives that are built internally on machine learning. If we can make machine learning so easy and abstract away the details so much that they become primitives in our programming language, and we can start building these larger and larger systems on small machine learning units that behave predictably. We're not there yet, but um, that's a sort of grand idea for the future. And these are uh, ideas from this article by Chris Ola, where you find sort of um, some relations between functional programming and, and the, the basic, the, the primitives of functional programming and the basic constructs of deep learning, like recurrent neural networks. Um, so let's broaden out what's it going to mean for society in a broader sense. Um, I think this paper here is a good indication of, of uh, what you might expect there, especially in areas like creative arts. So in this paper, what they did, they looked at, um, as an example, as a, an illustration of the concept they were trying to illustrate, they took a bunch of typefaces of fonts. Uh, and modeled them using, I think, a variational autoencoder or one of these generative models. And then they um, created this, uh, this sort of uh, mini app or, or a little tool where you can say, uh, these are a bunch of uh, regular sized fonts. Roman, I think the name is. These are a bunch of bold fonts. Now infer the bolding vector, which is like the smile vector. Infer the direction in latent space that makes fonts bold. And then apply that vector to this other font. So give me a bold version of this font. It might not be immediately obvious, but that's a kind of a difficult thing to do in fonts. To properly, automatically create a bold version of a given font is, is, is something that requires a bit of design and a bit of human uh, intuition. Um, and the same thing for an italic version of a font or a condensed version of a font, which is sort of uh, shrunk like that. And the, this was a kind of example to illustrate how machine learning can sort of influence the creative arts and that you can build this kind of model, you map to a latent space, and then use that latent space to manipulate your data, which paints a picture of a world where you can do things like this. These are just uh, mock-ups. But you can make a given person smile. So you can manipulate photorealistic data in this way. Or possibly you can look at this. Uh, you can uh, look at language in this way. So you can find a long sentence or a short sentence that nevertheless express the same meaning if you can lay out this latent space properly. And you can maybe even design molecules this way, where you um, want some, you uh, start with some molecule and you want to keep certain properties the same and change other properties, like the delayed fluorescence decay rate, whatever that is. And you can design, mo uh, you can hope to design molecules uh, in this way. That's called intelligence augmentation. That sort of idea for the future. So we have the idea of AI, which we're all familiar with, which is very old, that we're going to create autonomous intelligent agents. And the idea of intelligence augmentation is that maybe as an intermediate step before that, what we can, can, actu can actually do is sort of create a synthesis with the best of both worlds, where we can help, um, we can use all these methods not to create purely autonomous agents, but to enhance our own intelligent processes uh, and make machines do what machines do best and we do what we do best, we work together, um, but add some of this machine intelligence into uh, existing human processes like creativity, like writing, like uh, designing molecules, apparently. And uh, in this discussion of, of where AI is going and, and uh, where machine learning is going, uh, another term emerged, II which stands for intelligent infrastructure. And that sort of emerged as an answer to the question, why aren't machine learning researchers afraid of AI? Shouldn't we all be afraid of killer robots emerging? 
And the answer you get from most machine learning researchers, myself included, is uh, that, well, we don't really know if we should be afraid of that, but there are more immediate things that we should be more afraid of, uh, which is intelligent inf uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, let's start here. This is a um, program called GPT-2. You might have seen this in the news. Uh, OpenAI uh, made this um, system. And it's uh, the first system that can really generate language. In uh, it's, it's quite an impressive uh, language generator. Uh, it can generate language with sort of long-term coherence. So concepts, at the w we've seen quite impressive language generators as well which could sort of generate Shakespeare, for instance. But what you saw there is if you start, um, if they generate a bit of, bit of text for one character, they hallucinate one character called Pandorus, you'll never one page later see that same character. They don't have this long-term coherence where you actually, the same concept, it remembers what it's talking about, basically. So the language looks very natural, but it never remembers what it's talking about for more than two sentences. Whereas here you see the system with one, uh, so this bit was written by humans with some ideas like unicorns speaking perfect English in the Andes. And then it starts generating a very natural looking news article about uh, where at the end you can still see, well, it's imagined this guy called Dr. Jorge Perez. And the next paragraph he's still talking about Perez and it's remembered that they're venturing into a valley and that they're looking for unicorns, stuff like that. Um, so this was sort of a, a fun and very impressive model, but also something that slightly scared the researchers at OpenAI. There was a lot of controversy about whether they handled this properly, but their thinking was, if you can do this, then you can also generate, this is sort of so close that you can generate fake news <coughs> which we've seen can influence, uh, well, seems to be able to influence elections. Um, and you can do that at scale, basically, on your own computer. Any Anybody can now generate vast amounts of fake news, of, of, of manipulative content, stuff like that. Uh, so they made the decision not to, re uh, they released the paper, but they didn't release the model, and they didn't, re uh, didn't release the full model. They didn't release the software. Uh, which it would be normal in the for this kind of um, thing. So big controversy, lots of discussion about that. But basically the thing here is that we're starting to, to get to a point where um, these things are really affecting society in a big way. It really means something. Yeah, uh, you, know, you really have to think about these kinds of things when you make a, a system like this, how it can be used. Um, because we know that uh, if you have a, a, a thousand people who can pretend to be, uh, pretend to have a particular extreme opinion online, that you can influence the national discussion and influence the election of a, of a country. Um, but you do have to have an army of people sort of waging this kind of information uh, campaign. Um, and this kind of model sort of potentially stops that. This kind of model potentially means that any of you can do it also on your laptop. Uh, so we're reaching the point where we have to be uh, careful about certain AI things. Which brings me to the issue of algorithmic bias. So here at the top you see a, a little experiment you can do, or you could do, I think uh, uh, this uh, particular thing has been fixed now. But uh, up until recently you could do this where you Take a phrase, um, he is a nurse, she is a doctor. You translate it to a language like Turkish, which doesn't have gender-specific pronouns. So in Turkish, he and she is, I guess, O. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Turkish speakers. So you remove the information about whether this is a man or a woman, whether this is a man or a woman. You translate it back to English, and the translation model will infer the missing data. And of course, it will infer based on data. It will infer statistically. So the biases that are in the data will 
discrete into the output and you will see here's a Dr. Shield model. So you see that these kinds of machine learning models, they can, when they are put into to production, they reinforce biases in the data. Uh, this is a woman called, and I wrote this down, Joy Borlamwini, a machine learning researcher. She was working on face recognition, uh, working on existing systems for face recognition, and she realized that they wouldn't recognize her face. So she sort of couldn't do her job because this sy these production systems didn't recognize her face, and she ended up making a white mask for herself so that she, she could practically test these systems, which ended up being quite a powerful symbol for, um, for machine bias. Uh, and final example, uh, there was some research a few years ago where they just simply Google image searched uh, the word CEO and turned out that there were no, I think in the first page, there were no pictures of men, uh, pictures of women came up, all the pictures were of men. And the first picture to come up was a picture of Barbie to add insult to injury. And there's lots of examples, but I picked this one specifically because um, what they ended up with was, I think, uh, a percentage of about 10% of female CEOs in the entire uh, set of results. And you might say, well, I mean, Google is just reflecting reality. There are a few or two female CEOs, so it's reality that's biased, or it's reality that's sexist, and Google's just reflecting that. But actually, the percentage of female CEOs was about 27%. So in this case, the machine learning algorithm, and I'm pretty sure the people at Google aren't doing this on purpose, but the machine learning algorithm was amplifying the bias. It's not just that the data is biased, it's that the machine learning algorithm actually amplifies the bias. And this has been observed a lot of times. So here's an example from a paper. Oh, I apologies, I forgot to add the source. I'll add that later. Uh, but they look at um, something called visual semantic role labeling. And they saw that in this particular data set, there was a bias. So most of the time you see somebody cooking, it's a woman. Uh, but you can quantify that percentage. So you get a gender percentage here uh, of the training gender ratio. So four pictures of people cooking, there is a certain bias towards women. And what you see is that usually the machine learning model amplifies the bias. If you look at the predictions that the machine learning model gives, the biases are amplified, they are stronger. Uh, I try to find a reasonable explanation. I don't really know why this happens, why this is sort of seems to be a universal thing that machine learning algorithms do. I don't think it's really been figured out yet. Open question if you want to research this kind of stuff. Um, but that's important to recognize that it's not just a problem with the data. It's not just that the data happens to be biased and we just need better data. The machine learning algorithms also do something to make it worse. And once you start putting things into production, it can have unintended consequences. You may have seen this um, problem in uh, the news as well. Uh, Netflix had a nice idea that they would make uh, for their movies many different custom uh, thumbnails, also starring some of the minor characters, which seems like a nice idea. And then they would learn which type of thumbnails people responded to and show them those kinds of thumbnails to help their, uh, help some uh, movies that people would normally watch based on the poster help them help those movies reach a wider audience. Unfortunately, uh, one thing that the algorithm picked up on was that uh, movie uh, people in minorities often like, uh, well, they are looking for representation, so they like movies uh, that show people like them, like, like all of us do. Um, so the algorithm ended up doing things like this. So this is a movie starring two white people, romantic comedy, starring Lucy Liu and I don't know who this man is, um, let's say Diggs, as uh, side characters, minor characters, and the movie ended up presenting this thumbnail to black and Asian users, uh, which sort of made it look like this was a romantic comedy with these, uh, these people. So s suddenly, I think, largely from good intentions, suddenly Netflix had ended up with a system that was doing slightly racist things, um, which just goes to show that if you put a little bit of machine learning into your system, you need to be very careful 
uh, and monitor your system very carefully before it starts doing stuff like this, before it starts up doing, yeah, before it starts providing lots of unintended consequences. Uh, so this is sort of you know, a little PR problem for um, Netflix, but uh, they'll recover from it and it sort of all blows over. Uh, more serious problems happen when you do more serious things with machine learning. This is a famous case exposed by ProPublica, um, which basically showed that in, in, uh, in the US, a lot of um, parole decisions, a lot of uh, decisions, uh, uh, judicial decisions about people's uh, criminal future were being made based on a machine learning system, specifically machine learning systems that used about 120, 137 features about, about people, answers to questions they'd given, and it would predict um, basically the chance of recidivism. So basically the chance that a, a criminal being released um, would commit a crime again in the future. And when you, uh, you look at the behavior of this system, you see that it's disproportionately, uh, uh, that it's basically biased against black people. So it tends to uh, predict that black people will uh, go back to a life of crime more often. And it tends to make mistakes more for black people than for white people. Um, because of the reasons we've seen so far. Because there's bias in the data. Um, because there's bias in society. So America is a, a, a racially divided country where black people are on average uh, poor. So when people come out of prison, black people on average tend to go back to poorer neighborhoods where there is more crime. So on the one hand there was a, a, um, a bias problem in society, a bias problem in the data, and then a machine learning problem, a machine learning system amplifying that bias. So let's try and unpack that and see um, if any of this kind of thing is ever really justified. Let's see how much time I have left. Uh, yeah, I have to. Um, so let's say that the data is a fair representation of our population. Just assume. And let's say that the predictions in some sense are accurate. Let's say that we have a model and somebody says, you know, it works. Um, why don't we, why aren't we allowed to use it now? Why are we still <coughs> racist if the data is a fair representation of the population and the predictions happen to work? Well, that brings us to the problem of racial profiling and just to show that this is not just an American problem, this happens in Dutch society as well. This is a <coughs> issue that was in the news a few years ago. It's a Dutch rapper called Typhoon uh, who was uh, stopped in his car because basically he was a black man driving a nice car. So the police pulled him over. Um, and the main thing was that the police response was more or less, uh, yeah, that's what we do. Yes, we profile. And as you can see, the Dutch public, uh, the response from the Dutch public was largely, uh, okay, that's fine. Um, so that's worth digging into. And in order to um, sort of be a bit sensitive about how I phrase these things and what I say here, let's be specific. So we go back to America where these things are uh, quantified a little bit more uh, often and more precisely. So in America you have, the people are quite often sort of quantified into uh, racial categories. I don't think it's very common in Europe, but it, it happens in America a lot more. Um, and there are very sort of strict guidelines for how to do this, how or when to call somebody black versus when to call them Hispanic or Latino or white or Asian. Um, and then you, the benefit of that is that you can study these problems. So you can ask, is there, um, so let's be talk about a specific crime, uh, uh, drug crime, so being in possession of drugs or dealing drugs. Is that more prevalent in the black community than the white community? And you can say, well, Yes, there is. Uh, there are more drug crimes for various reasons, such as poverty and ho uh, historical and cultural reasons. There are more drug crimes among 
American black people than among American white people. So this is the sort of thing you might see pulled up as a defense of racial profiling. People say, well, this line is higher than this. So if we're looking for drug criminals, why aren't we allowed to racial profile? Well, step one is that it is, this is uh, a fairly classic case of the prosecutor's fallacy. Basically confusing your conditional distributions. So the probability that somebody is black, given that they use drugs, that's what we were looking at here. And the probability that somebody uses drugs or is involved in drug crime, given that they're black, that's what we're dealing with when we pull somebody over. So these are very different probabilities. The, most, the clearest example is the probability that a basketball player is tall is different from the probability that a tall person plays basketball. So in this case, it's very straightforward to say that if somebody is a basketball player, they are tall. But if we are looking for tall people, I'm showing this note. If we, sorry, so if we know that somebody plays basketball, we know that they're tall. But if we're looking for basketball players, it's still pretty inefficiently to just go up to random tall people and ask if they're basketball players. In, it works in the sense that it, uh, they're more likely to be basketball players than short people. But it's still a huge population that you're asking whether they're basketball players, which is a harmless thing to do. But pulling somebody over and asking, uh, checking them for drugs is not a harmless thing to do. Uh, can we just forbid this if we understand racial? Prof if we, uh, you know, if we say racial profiling is wrong, can we just forbid it? Well, that's actually quite difficult because you can allow disallow the use of gender and ethnicity and sexual orientation. But then race was not included as a feature in this uh, parole uh, prediction system. And they still, uh, they still ended up with a racist system. Because most of these attributes can be inferred are strongly correlated with other attributes. So if I have your postcode and not your ethnicity, I can probably still guess your ethnicity with a reasonable accuracy. So I can still be racist. And then there are companies which are abroad, uh, which are also creating these machine learning systems that are also affecting society. So let's say we understand the prosecutor's fallacy. We have the data that is fair, the predictions are accurate, and we've correctly used Bayes' rule. We still get a high probability, given all the features, that some, including ethnicity, that somebody is a criminal, are we now allowed to racially profile? If we correct for using the, if we correct for the prosecutor's fallacy, are we still, are we now allowed to profile people? Um, that's not a machine learning issue. That's more of a morality issue. But I would say it's important to separate actions from predictions. So the argument that your predictions are now very accurate, that you now have very accurate probabilities, is not an argument for what action to take. It doesn't mean that your actions based on those predictions are good, are moral, are fair, are going to have good effects, aren't going to hurt anybody. It just means that the predictions are accurate. It's offline learning. We haven't modeled the interaction with the world. We haven't modeled any feedback loops. We're only predicting. We haven't modeled what our actions based on the predictions are going to do. And I would say that it's fundamentally unfair to hold an individual responsible for the actions of others that share their attributes. That's sort of a, you need to disagree with this, but then you're sort of disagreeing with a fundamental tenet of, of morality, I would say. Everybody has a right, if you are going to be judged, if you are going to uh, experience negative consequences, then you have the right that that happens based on what you did, not based on what somebody else did who looks like you, even if there's a really strong statistical correlation. And the problem happens when hold responsible is not literally sending somebody to prison, but are these micro things, these micro annoyances, these micro consequences, like traffic stops given, well, parole is not a micro consequence, but being searched at an airport, not getting a credit card, having a difficult job interview, 
having different working environment, these are all things that are where you're not being consciously held responsible for something, but it all still adds up. So it's all problems that already exist in society and we already have to deal with. But once we start building machine learning pro uh, systems and we start scaling them up, we end up with a new problem because instead of having lots of flawed humans doing things, we have one flawed machine learning component rolled out at scale, making lots of uh, decisions, and that's sort of a new area. China's a little bit uh, ahead of us here. They are building a social credit system where they're sort of assigning people a credit, uh, a social score based on everything they've done. Um, pooling information from lots of uh, lots of areas and uh, using lots of machine learning components in that pooling. So this sort of thing worries me a lot. Um, <coughs> and what we've seen is that politicians aren't going to stop this and human beings aren't going to stop this. They're usually fine with this. So in order for systems being built, systems like this to be built responsibly, what we need is a population of uh, computer scientists and uh, information scientists, data scientists who know about these problems and who can deal with them responsibly and can make sure that these systems are built with a degree of responsibility. And basically, I think that's you guys. It's not me. I'm just a scientist. You guys are going to go out into the world and build these kinds of systems. So I hope I've given you some idea of um, what to expect and how to do these kinds of things. That's all for me. Uh, I wish you good luck with the exam and uh, with the final project. <laughs>